want to go over a few uh, basics um, of the, how this webinar works. You should see a slide in front of you. There's the main area, which is called the presentation um, viewing area. You'll see the slides, videos, and polling. We don't have any uh, polls for this particular webinar, um, but we occasionally do on some of the other ones. You'll also see a Q&A section. This allows you to write in questions. They come into us. We, we can answer them as the webinar is going on. And then also any questions later uh, when you're either viewing the webinar on demand or after the presentation ends, you can as well still submit questions and we will answer them as we get to them. You'll also see a sp uh, speaker bio, which is pretty short. Uh, we also have a reference list. <laughs> you will notice that we have a copy of the presentation as well as um, some quick start guides and some manuals on our 370XA, the 700XA, and our 1500XA uh, GCs. There's also in the bottom um, corner, the bottom right corner at Media Controls, this is where you can control uh, the volume of the, of, the, of the presentation. We also have a social steering button. This is basically Twitter if you want to send this out to your friends and let them know this presentation is going on. And then obviously you can also hit uh, the email button if you have any questions later or if you have something specifically you want to uh, talk about, we can also, we'll receive that privately and we can answer that later. So uh, moving forward, uh, the only one that else I do want to mention to you, I noticed on the flyer that we did correct it. This is in general installation considerations for GCs in general, not specific to us or a particular GC. I did notice that on the sign-in on the webinar, it did unfortunately say it focused on the 370XA. So that's not true. This is going to be more of a generic presentation today. So when we think about installing a GC, there's generally four things we look at. The environment that the GC will be in, as well as the environment that the worker will be in. The footprint, basically, will everything fit? How much space do you need? the impact of these two items then on the sample line and things that we need to consider. And then finally, we'll look at power considerations. Before we start um, into the full presentation, I just want to do a level set on the typical installation uh, diagram. If you uh, look at your screen, you notice first we have a dual high pressure regulator on the carrier gases. We then also have a regulator that we will put on the calibration gas. We also have there a purge vent for calibration, so it comes very handy when you're changing the calibration gas. Uh, in some applications, there will be a heater blanket for the calibration gas, especially if that's on the outside in a colder environment with certain um, uh, sample or calibration streams that you're using. We obviously would need a probe. Uh, that would be in the, the air tubing or your pipe. We also, with that probe, recommend a particular filter. And then you may or may not have a, um, a heat trace line. Uh, that, again, will depend on what your sample stream composition is and your environment. We then have what we call a vent for fast loop, or you may hear us refer to it as a bypass flow. And then, um, do that both the measurement and the sample vents need to be referenced to atmosphere. Uh, we obviously have a vent that either if this was in the shelter that would go outside or we would vent uh, outside the GC. And then finally in this particular um, installation we're kind of outlining everything would be within a shelter but as we go through this presentation uh, we'll talk about cases where a shelter would not necessarily be needed. Okay. So the first topic is the environment. And what you notice is that our GCs and pretty much our, our manufacturer GCs can take some very cold and very hot environments. Our GCs are actually rated down to minus 40 F or 40 C. Uh, that's actually quite cold. Now for hazardous locations, uh, the GC is actually rated from minus 4 to 104 F or minus 20 C to 60 C. 
But basically, as you can see in the, the, the picture there, we show that every GC out of Emerson is tested or chamber tested, thermal cycled. So basically the GC soaks for six hours at zero F. It also then ramps for eight hours to 180, 130 degrees Fahrenheit for another six hours. So a total of 24 hours that we temperature cycled the GC. So I don't know about you, but it'd be very, very tough for me to spend six hours at zero degrees Fahrenheit or minus 18 C. In fact, actually within 10 minutes, you would actually start having frostbite. So these are things that you need to consider that the GC can take the cold and the GC can take the hot. It's whether the person who needs to work on the GC can uh, work in such an environment. They so may be thinking, well, my area doesn't get cold. Well, here's a picture of the US. Um, you'll notice that areas between the dotted white line and the solid white line um, can have temperatures below freezing or around freezing for most of the year or the winter period. So that's relatively cold if you had to be out there for any length of time. And then if you look at the northern part of the U.S., I'd consider that area called dang cold. And you definitely would not want to be out there for any length of period. So that would come into play when we start talking about the shelters and footprints and things that you need is what type of conditions will the GC be in as well as the uh, technician or the engineer working on the GC. And as a call out to my boss, because we always do think the U.S. can be cold as well as other countries like China. Well, Australia, which we think is a dry a desert country, actually gets cold as well. It's pretty close to the South Pole. So you notice that areas uh, below the dotted white line, those are the gray and pink areas, they also get uh, freezing or below. So again, a consideration in areas that may you not normally think about getting cold could indeed have such an environment. Um, <clears throat> in addition to considering the environment for the GC, you also have to consider and the uh, operator also consider the environment for the sample. So if you look at this chart, this is um, a natural gas application. And you'll notice that there is a trend where the, the amount of C6 plus component starts dropping off and then quickly rises again a few hours later. And you'll notice the impact of, of having the, basically the higher hydrocarbons drop out has a major impact on the BTU measurement. And when we take a closer look at it, we can see what's happening. When the sun starts to set, the actual um, sample temperature or the uh, sample coming through the sample line starts decreasing. And what that happens is what causes the something we call hydrocarbon dew point to drop out or liquid drop out. And that affects the amount of um, components in the uh, C6 analysis, which then in turn affects the BTU. If you were a natural gas provider selling this gas, you would actually, in a sense, have um, lost and unaccounted for because you would be selling higher BTU product than what you're actually saying you have by, by your sample analysis. Okay. So now we've talked about the effect of the environment on the GC, the operator, the sample gas, and now look at the calibration gas. Uh, as the calibration gas is supposed to be representative of what you have flowing um, in your system, it also as well could be affected by temperature or your environment. So in this particular example, you can see that the hydrocarbon dew point is around 32 degree Fahrenheit or zero degree Celsius. So if you had um, had this and you had it outside one of those environments that we showed above, above the dotted lines for the US or below the dotted line if you were in Australia, you would ha have an issue if you didn't take precautions around your calibration gas. Um, once you've actually had um, your, your calibration gas has gone below its hydrocarbon dew point temperature, the, heavy, the heavier components within that calibration gas will drop out. If you are currently using that gas when this happens, you will have basically spoiled or ruined the calibration gas because you will now have not taken the components out in the correct ratio. And you will now not know what your concentration of the heavy versus the light in the cylinder is. You've basically just got a nice anchor weight, and you will need to buy new calibration gas. Um, 
Um, do, do note, if you have not opened or just storing the calibration gas, there is a process where you can actually uh, bring it back up to temperature and have the, um, the, the calibration gas be the right mixture. Well, this is also, we're just going to quickly talk about, since we're talking about the sample, some typical handle sampling system required. You first notice that there is a probe tip. We normally recommend that there be a particular filter there. We also recommend that the probe be put on the center line of the, the pipe about a third of the way in. You want it more than two inches so that you're not picking up the contamination off the pipe wall. And really no more than 10 inches because what happens is then you become this uh, very long antenna in your pipe that could eventually go downstream and cause um, equipment issues. You'll also notice that we have a probe regulator, and that's generally uh, in certain applications where the pressure in the pipe may be flowing significantly higher than what it's needed for the sample. Generally, our sample pressures are about anywhere from 15 PSI to 30 PSI. Uh, you may then also want a heated probe enclosure uh, that's more in line with the dual Thompson effect, that if you have a high pressure running in your pipe and then you uh, regulate the pipe, uh, regulate that pressure down. For every um, 100 PSI that you drop the pressure, you'll drop seven degrees in temperature. So you need to watch size that may impact uh, your hydrocarbon dew point. On certain applications, you may also need a heat trace uh, sample line, uh, again, depending on your environment and the uh, composition of your sample. And then we also recommend uh, the sample system for the GC, this is really your last line of defense of preventing any contaminants from entering into the GC and causing an expensive repair. We do recommend a two micron particle filter as well as a bypass or membrane filter. Okay, was there any questions before we go on to footprint? Okay. So when we're um, considering the footprint, there's a couple things to consider beyond just the GC. <clears throat> so if you look at this uh, particular picture, you'll see we have the GC in there. Uh, this is our model 500. You'll have a sample system that's located below the GC, but you also have utility uh, gases. So in addition to the uh, physical dimensions of the particular products, you also have to look at access in terms of uh, maintenance and how you um, Space needed around the products, as well as mounting. Can you mount it directly across against a wall? Or are you mounting this outside? And then you have your tubing connections. What's the best way and how much space they need? And then your communication power cabling requirements, especially for certain certification requirements. And they can also take up a considerable amount of space. So we need to have this all mapped out. It's also going to be recommended that most of the information about, particularly on the gas chromatograph, about how much um, access space they need and how, how big their footprint is can be found on the manuals and drawings on the website. And this is both for um, Emerson as well as our competitors as well have their manuals on their websites. And you can review this before you've actually purchased the equipment or before you invest in laying down a, a pad or something. So we'll start out just kind of running an example by you. So if we start out with the GC, and this is the top view of our 700XA, and if we would look at the drawing, it would tell us basically its length and width is uh, 20 inches by 22 inches. And for you those who don't live off of inches, about 20 inches is equivalent to almost 51 centimeters, and 22 inches is about 56 centimeters. If we had looked at the manual, we would notice that it would tell us that we need a clearance of 14 inches on both sides of the GC, as well as 14 inches in the front. So that was equivalent to about 35 centimeters. And the reason you have that, if you can look from the top view, you can see where we have some tubing connections, both on the left side and the right side of the uh, GC, as well as on the right side of the 700XA is also a, a porthole that you can enable to remove boards from. And then the 14 inches from the front of the GC is that the LOI can come off in another access point. 
So you do want to keep that in mind when you're laying out the GC. It's not just the GC that's dimensions, but the access as well. So together, this would be, you need about a three feet by four feet um, area. And if, it, if I can convert that to you for in meters, it's basically four feet is equal to 1.22 meters and 36 inches, three feet is equal to basically a little bit less than one meter. So that's just for the GC. But you may have other items uh, in there as well. In this particular case, maybe you will have the calibration gas next to the GC. And what we generally use here in the factory is the 108 cylinder. And that's about a diameter of 15 inches or basically 38 centimeters. We also recommend that you have two, caliber, uh, two carrier gas cylinders. These are a bit smaller. Um, they're about nine inches in diameter each or basically uh, 23 centimeters. So this is this particular layout. Um, you would also need to leave some space uh, for the worker. Obviously, things could change in this, in this example. We're assuming this sample handling system is underneath the GC. Uh, depending on what layout you pick in, in your particular application, the sample system may be next to the GC. It also may be on the other side of the wall, along with the carrier gases and the calibration gas. So it really, you need to kind of just sketch this out, what you think of how much space you'll actually need. So we talked about the, the length and, and the width, but there's another thing you may consider, especially if you're putting this in a full shelter, is the height of the um, products. So in this particular view, you can see both the height of the carrier cylinders as well as the calibration cylinders, and then the height um, this is a particular example is our 700 XA, and it's about 65 inches, which basically converts to 1.65 meters. But you need to also consider the height of removing, in this particular GC, the hat or the cap. And that's uh, the recommendation is about 20, 14 to 25 inches, so an additional 63 centimeters for a total of 90 inches, basically 2.3 meters. And so while you may be able to get the GC through the door of a full shelter, if you are doing some cabling and using the cable trays at the top, you want to make sure where you place the GC, there's still enough clearance to get the cap off. So you mentioned that. Um, now that you're looking at, you, you looked at the environment and you've looked at the amount of space you need, it helps determine what your shelter configurations are. So in some cases, you do not need a shelter. So in this particular view that you're looking at, it's our 370XA, um, it's in a natural gas application. It's in a warmer temperature environment, it's more in the uh, southern part of the US. It's not in a shelter. So it takes a very little small footprint and it can be put right next to the sample line. We know, uh, we also have, in the next scene are something that we sell as well as our competitors. These are enclosures. They're kind of small uh, boxes, and these come in handy in areas where you really want to make sure your uh, sample line is maintained above its hydrocarbon dew point as well as the carrier gases. So um, this would be an example of a heated box uh, where both the calibration and the sample lines temperatures are maintained above the hydrocarbon dew point. Um, the carrier gases would obviously be on the outside. So this doesn't take up a small a bigger size footprint. In fact, these are basically less than five inches in length and width. The one consideration you would need to be would be the height. Uh, when those doors are open, what is the total overall height, just in case you have anything that's overhanging the area. Another possible option, basically, if you are in a more uh, moderate environment, is a cabinet. And so these are a bit bigger, take up a little bit bigger footprint. They can. This particular example does not show the calibration or the carrier gases inside the cabinet. That is a potential option, and then the footprint would be slightly uh, larger. But these are, again, cases where your environment is a bit more moderate. Um, you do have concerns about um, high carbon dew point um, affecting your sample. Your, probably your calibration gas would be covered with a heated blanket if it's not inside the, the cabinet. So again, you know, this particular example would not protect necessarily the worker from a cold environment, but it would protect the GC if you were doing maintenance from any driving rain or snow. 
Uh, another option that we see people have, and this is generally is more in the more moderate climates to warmer climates, is a three-sided shelter. This does protect um, the GC as well as the operator or the uh, maintenance tech from um, flowing rain, blowing snow, the beating sun, et cetera. Um, so it's, maybe it's not the best option for very cold climates where it's um, you know, zero degrees Fahrenheit minus 18 C, but generally in the more moderate temperatures uh, or particular applications that are less affected by temperature, this gives some good protection for the GC as well as the operator. And then we have um, the full shelter applications. So these obviously are significantly significant in size for uh, footprint. Uh, they do take up differently more space. A lot of times you'll see them with multiple analyzers. They'll also have things such, such as HVAC, lighting, um, maybe a control panel. So they're much more complex installations. And these we often more see in process applications. As you probably expect, um, starting from the left and going to the right, we will increase in price as you increase in footprint and complexity. Um, but also, as you increase now your, your size that you need or, or your footprint, it also affects the impact of how close you can get to so your sample size. As I mentioned, the no shelter, the 370 XA in the first picture, you're very, very close to your sample point. Obviously, if you have a full shelter, it's highly unlikely you're going to be right at your sample point. In fact, you probably could be a considerable distance away. And that would bring us to our next um, segment, which is called the sample line considerations. Uh, before we start, any questions? Okay. So, is it safe to store hazardous calibration gas near the GC? So, I would say. Yes, um, it's it basically your concern would be more if you were venting it in the area. So if you say um, it's H2S, you're, if you're working in a cabinet or basically a shelter, you would not want to vent that inside. So you would actually have a gas detector, which we just naturally sell ourselves as well. So we we would help you with that. There's also scrubbers you can buy as well uh, for any. Um, um, exhaust, and we'll talk about that because we do need to talk about vents that's further on in the presentation. Right. So, um, but just to let you know, the GCs, I think we talked about on the original slide, we do, our GCs are kind of rated depending on your option, ATEX or Class 1 Div 1. Um, so you, and also where you install the GC also needs to have the same certification rate. So we do think, we are just at a, um, process plant yesterday and they have class one div two, but everything in the analyzer housing had to be a class one div two. I don't know if you could see it in that one um, shelter picture, but you probably would have seen the tubing is just not your standard everyday cabling. It's in um, basic certified um, conduit. So yes. Okay. So sample line considerations. So basically, when you look at this, uh, your sample line, and sometimes we'll call it as um, sample lag time, you're basically looking at the transportation time, which is basically the time you pull the sample till it actually reaches the GC. And then you'll obviously will consider the time of the GC analysis, because that's your analyze, analyst update time, which, which is a combination of both. And that's important. Uh, it happens more in process applications than if you're making a process modification how long would you have before you would have data showing the change effect? Um, but you'll see that in most cases, especially more in the natural gas application, um, the transportation time could be a significantly portion of the overall analysis update time. And so we need to, to watch that because you call, we would say you would not be getting quote unquote fresh samples. But you just see what the impact of how this distance can be to your sample uh, to lag time, there's a little formula. And basically, it's the length of your pipe times the cross area section of your pipe or your tubing, and then the flow rate. So if we would look at a typical case example, <clears throat> we'll say your pipeline is about, you're about 20 feet away from your sample point, which basically on some applications is pretty close if you, again, had that full shelter. 
you would not be that close to your sample point. Uh, we went with the traditional uh, quarter-inch sample line tubing. <clears throat> and then a flow rate about 50 cc's per minute. Basically, that's a combination of the flow to the GC as well as the flow through the bypass meter. In this particular case, our target was to get a transportation time to the GC of less than one minute. So if we work out the math and just on the given information, it would take us two minutes, almost three minutes, to get just the transportation time, then plus whatever your uh, sample analysis time is to get your total update analysis time. So that's pretty long, especially if you need to have a, you know, a quick uh, feedback loop. There's a couple of things that we can look at. We can change the tubing size. If we do that, it does actually uh, cut out about a minute in um, transportation time, which is which we're getting closer to our goal. Obviously, there's some considerations that you have to watch about pressure drops when you have to go too small. Uh, obviously, there's some other um, impacts as well. If we decide instead of not changing the tubing size that we want to change the flow rate uh, to get to the one minute, if we check, we'd almost have to go to about 400 cc's per minute. Um, the downside of doing that, especially if you're not having your um, sample line go back into your process, that could be either a lot of um, basically product that you are basically throwing away or that you're venting to atmosphere. And that could be another issue if you have particular hazardous or toxic um, components within your gas. So you do try to find a happy medium in that, and that's why, again, it comes back to consideration. If you're able to use a less complex shelter, so maybe a more moderate environment, a more simple application, and you can be closer to your sample point, the better, but we obviously realize that's not always possible. So do keep in mind the, the impact of the further away you are from your sample point, how it's going to affect your um, analysis time. And then maybe say the, what the goal is, though, in this particular case, we said one minute, but you do want to have your cycle time basically half the time it takes to analyze your sample. So if you have a 20-minute process, uh, analyzing time, sample time, you're going to want a 10 minute, no more than 10 minutes of a transportation time. And then obviously, if you're natural gas, what would you think of one minute to five minutes? Um, you, you're going to have to look at a lot of considerations because you may all need a transportation time of 30 seconds or less in some cases. Okay, so we kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier about the need for vents. The GC operates on gas, and so therefore the gas has to go somewhere and it vents. Um, there's the bypass flow vent, or um, we talked about originally and back on like slide three. There's a measure vent, which is basically consists of your carrier gas and your sample gas. You also have your sample vent because you're constantly throwing, flowing through the sample loop. That gas has to go somewhere. And then you have your actuation vent, and that is basically the vent of the gases that are used to actuate the diaphragm valves or your analytical valves. As we know at the bottom, when we say it must go to a safe area, that really refers to the first three types of vents. And the reason we say that is if you have any hazardous contaminants like H2S, et cetera, you do not want to be venting to where people are, are um, operating. Okay. So basically this, what you're looking at here is our single stream um, bypass flow vent. And uh, the reason we do have the one, um, so you have the sample stream coming in through that uh, second line. It's going through a particular filter. Then it's going what we call through a membrane filter or a bypass filter. And when it hits there, the sample goes two different directions. It goes up to the sample loop. That's the thin blue line. It also goes down to the bypass um, loop, and that's a heavier line, and then out. So that could either go to a flare line or it could go back into your, um, to your process line. And pretty much we consider that a fast loop. You want that to be run at least twice the flow rate of, of what your sample flow rate would be. Uh, that way you're always, again, considering that you have a fresh uh, sample. And in this particular layout, uh, you do have a rotometer so you can see what your flow rate is. We don't normally tell people to make sure the little ball is somewhere at the 50% mark. And you could adjust it with the valve 
on the left hand side. So this is, if you'll see, uh, basically a flow diagram. And so in this particular example, we are using a helium carrier. And you can see that it basically comes in and you can see where it gives um, kind of a, a torturous path, but it eventually lines up with the sample loop and it blends with the sample and it goes back through the valve and comes back through uh, the measurement side of the detector and back out. So um, depending on your application, you could just vent uh, some, you know, or more natural gas applications without hazardous uh, components. Vents to, at, vents to atmosphere, and we do need atmospheric um, pressure. We can't have any back pressure on this particular vent. Um, so that is critical. Um, if you again have hazardous, you can do a trace erase or you can do a scrubber, but make sure there is no back pressure. Um, this is just views of our 370XA and our 700XA where you would find the uh, measurement vent on the GCs. So on the 370XA, it's on the left-hand side, as well as on the 700XA, it's on the left-hand side. And that's also a reason, because of the you see the tubing there, that we do have, that you have about seven inches of clearance space to get your hands in there in case you ever have to connect or disconnect the tubing. So the other vent that we, um, or the third vent dealing uh, with the sample is the sample vent. As I mentioned, we are constantly running sample or sweeping sample uh, gas through the sample loop. And we saw that uh, when we looked at the bypass flow picture, where we saw basically a, almost like a slipstream stream of the sample constantly being pulled off and running through the sample loop. Because our sample um, volume is determined uh, to, or I should put it this way, to avoid having various um, effects of having various sample pressure, we vent the sample loop to atmospheric pressure. So that basically we have a pretty much consistent volume or a relatively consistent volume of sample being injected every single time. But because of that, that means we also have to reference atmosphere. Again, if you are having um, H2S or other um, less than desirable components in your, your sample gas and you cannot uh, vent to atmosphere or reference to atmosphere, there's a couple of options. And so we'll blow up that diagram and you can see in this particular one, they, um, their sample vent uh, leaves and then they, have, they can either go to the flare, which would be a higher pressure and therefore something that would be very hard to reference uh, to atmosphere or could affect the uh, sample control loop size that we have the option as an ARV or an atmospheric reference vent. And so in this particular case, the reference vent is closed, but right before we take a new sample, we would actually close the sample vent, vent the sample loop to atmospheric pressure to equalize it, and then we would inject the sample and we obviously would close, the AVR would close. That makes sense to everybody. And then here again on our 370 and our 700 XA, we show where you would find the sample vent as well uh, on the left hand side and the right hand side on the 700 XA right below the measurement vent. The last vent that we talk about is the actuation vent. Generally, we're using um, in our gases like helium, air, nitrogen that um, we're pretty safe to vent to atmosphere. Uh, again, these are vents, so you generally don't have to worry about having scrubbers or uh, um, an ARV or a, a trace erase. But these are um, gases that obviously that control the, the analytical valve. And again, look at your manual to know what pressure ratings you have. Uh, they do vary depending on the GC that you're using, whether ours or other manufacturers. But again, on the 370XA, they're located on the left-hand side. And then on the 700XA, they are located on the right-hand side. So again, this is also another reason that you do need that access space so that you can get to these connections. 
So our next section that we'll go on to, or in the last section, is power. Okay. Ooh, there's a lot of question. Okay. Is it transportation absurd after the first analysis? It would be, um, well, I would say it before the, yeah. yeah. Transportation is considered after the first, yeah. So that's every update. So you would add that for, once you had your first analysis done, then the time before you would see the reading of the next analysis would be your transportation time plus the time of the sample. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Shane here. Um, just to clarify that answer there, um, even though you'll get analysis updates every four minutes, which is the cycle of the GC, or maybe you have a three-minute GC or a 10-minute GC, the analysis updates will, um, will be the analysis cycle time. But the sample that's being analyzed will be older than that. It will be your sample lag time. So even though you'll get updates every five minutes, that update is actually for gas that may be 15 minutes ago in the actual pipeline. So um, to look at the total analysis lag time, you're looking at the sample lag time plus the analysis time. So you may get updates every four minutes, but those updates will be of gas that was actually in the sample line uh, four minutes plus the sample lag time. Um, so yeah, when you're looking at the total analysis lag time, you need to consider the sample lag time as well. Um, there's another question that I wanted to uh, answer as well, which was, uh, if I have a typical dew point of zero degrees, do I need to heat my sample line? The sample temperature is 55 degrees Fahrenheit, and sample line is uh, 20 foot outside and 20 foot inside a heated building. And I am uh, located in the mid-Atlantic portion of the East Coast. And um, I would say that the, the rule of thumb is is that you need to assume that the gas that's inside a pipeline, um, if you're looking at a hydrocarbon mixture, especially natural gas today, um, the worst case assumption that you make is that the hydrocarbon dew point of the gas is the same as the pipeline temperature. Um, if it's higher, then you're going to have two-phase flow inside the pipeline and we'll only sample the gas anyway. So the hydrocarbon dew point of that gas that's being sampled will be the sample, uh, the, the pipeline temperature or the, the uh, process temperature. So to ensure that that sample remains consistent going to the GC, you need to keep the sample at a temperature higher than what that pipeline or process temperature is. If you, if you go below that pipeline or process temperature, then there's a risk that some of the components will drop out and you'll change your sample. So in your case there, um, if the typically during winter on the east coast of North America and, and anywhere where it gets, well, to, to be honest, anywhere in the world where it gets cold, typically in the middle of winter at night, the sample temperature in the pipeline or in the process will be hotter than the ambient because it's moving, there's some energy in there, it's actually heated up. And so as a result, if the temperature is hotter in the pipeline or the process than the outside, then you need to heat trace that line to stop the dropout occurring in that line, in that sample line, because it comes out of the pipeline or comes out of the process tapping and then it's going to be exposed to the ambient. And if that's lower than what the process or pipeline temperature is, then there is a risk of dropout. So yes, we recommend that, especially in the natural gas, if you're, I'm assuming there that uh, you're in the natural gas business. Today we have some very heavy gases hitting the network. So we recommend, even if you're in um, not just the east coast, um, if you're in a desert area where it gets really cold in the middle of the night, um, it, you still should heat trace your lines to ensure that you always keep the sample above the temperature of the process tap point, uh, where you take that sample from. Okay, so hopefully I've answered that question. The next one was, um, is it mandatory to install a sample preconditioning sim system before a gas chromatograph, or is the sample preconditioning system already included in a gas chromatograph? Um, it's a good question. Um, it would be great if your gas was always clean and dry, uh, but I know very few processes where the sample is always clean and dry. 
Now we do include a particulate filter and a uh, liquid filter on most of our gas chromatograph sample systems, depending on the application, but for definitely the majority of them, we would include a, a micron filter and a liquid filter, but really that is the last line of defense. And also that is located at the GC. So if you do have contamination and we stop it at the GC sample system, it means that all of that sample line that's leading to the GC is going to become contaminated. It's going to become more contaminated as time goes on. So the best practice is definitely to have filtration at the sample point so that you don't contaminate your sample lines, you don't contaminate uh, the rest of the system, and then to have the last line of defense being at the GC. Um, so that's definitely the best practice to do primary filtration at the sample point and then do um, a last line of defense at the GC itself. Um, there was another one that I wanted to look at. Um, no, I think that, that's it for the questions at the moment. So, um, so we'll go on with the, the rest of the okay. presentation. So uh, basically, the one of the last sections we'll look at is the power specification. So we've looked at the environment, the impact on the GC, your sampling, your calibration gas. Uh, we also looked at the footprint, how big, how big a space you'll need, and then the impact of that space allocation and where and how you're um, in the environment and how that affects the sample line. And so power is kind of the last thing we look at, but obviously it's very important. Uh, you can find out what your options are to power your GC. Uh, it's found in the manual. I know nobody reads the manual, but it's also found on the data sheet, and that's both for our GCs as well as our competitors. But it's important to spec this out. You need to know, understand what type of power you're going to have at your location and the amount of power the GC comes in and how much you're going to need. So an example, um, the top one is our 370XA. It's DC powered only. So that needs to be, if you are in a section, um, obviously it's low power, uh, how you're going to power that. Uh, the option below for the 700XA both is DC, low power, as well as AC. Um, so you need to consider that before when you're purchasing it, how much power you're going to need. Uh, a couple things to consider both is the startup power, which is basically the reason it's higher than the steady rate, is that you obviously, the GC has a heater. Uh, to make the constant temperature of the columns as well as the TCD. And so you need to look at that as well of how much power you're going to need uh, in the beginning as well as what you're setting up. But you also want to look at when you read uh, the manual and pull out this information, there's other information in the, in the manual regarding your need um, for circuit breakers. Um, basically, the wire gate and the cabling compliance. Many times when we sell either a CSA or ATEX units, there's other requirements needed for installation for electrical aspects. You need to consider that um, whether or not you need the power disconnect and what type of filter you may need on that line and the gauge of the wire. Uh, and obviously we do have a lot of um, safety as well as warnings in the beginning part of the installation portion of the manual to make sure this is done by a certified person who understands uh, the electrical requirements. That said, there's a couple of things that you can look at. Obviously, AC, uh, there's a few tidbits uh, we have down here. Uh, you want to make sure it's clean. Uh, obviously, if you uh, want to filter nice, good sine waves, uh, we obviously, UPS is also kind of how you make it if you don't have consistent power in your particular area. For the, and, and DC power, again, it kind of goes back to the gauge of the wire that I mentioned, but also Talking about large voltage drops, again, that can affect the DC and starve it of power and therefore impact your readings. Uh, solar, obviously that would be DC. In that particular case, you'd want it, instead of uh, sizing for the steady state, you would size it for startup as uh, solar generally runs off of batteries. Uh, your other option then is UPS. Um, and the first comment is, don't use cheap UPSs. So I do want to point out, I couldn't find a picture of a, a cheap UPS. We did try doing a lot of eBay searching and couldn't find one. So this is not an example of a cheap UPS, but more of an example of the type you'd want to get if you had the budget. Uh, 
And so, uh, but it's the preferred way. Obviously, it's important that you have steady state power or clean power go into your GC. Um, obviously, you'll, be, you'll get a nice alarm system if you keep shutting off the power to the GC as well as impact uh, your ability to get measurements out. That also said, um, when you order the GC, because many times these are type certifications, we've run into issues where people have ordered a GC, uh, maybe especially more on the AC side, and got you know 120 versus the 230 voltage, and they want to know if they can just put a transformer on it. Same thing, people have ordered AC and then really wanted DC, and they can only just put a transformer on it. If you, we can't make modifications. If, well, the way we shipped you the GC is the way it was certified. So if you make modifications in the field, you could be affecting the certification. Obviously, you could send the GC back to us, and we can make the modifications. But in the field, changing an AC unit to a DC unit and vice versa could impact the certification requirement. So this is at the end of the last slide. Um, if there's any more questions, you'll notice that oh, I saw my boss just stand up, so it tells me there are more questions. So I thought we were going to finish on time. Okay. Okay, it's Shane here again. <laughs> um, we've got a couple of questions about uh, hazardous area vents. Uh, oh, sorry, hazardous gas vents. And so I figured um, I would uh, come up and, and answer those questions. Um, when you do need to send your sample to a flare, um, it does bring up some issues because um, flare lines uh, can have very varying, uh, a large variation in the pressure, um, and so there'll be a large, uh, well, it could be a small or a large back pressure put on the sample line. So it's one thing is really important to make sure you have a check valve on there so that whatever is in the flare line doesn't go back to the GC. Um, the other issue is that um, the, the question there, was that uh, if we do send it to um, to flare, how do we does the back pressure induce an error? And that is exactly why we have an atmospheric referencing vent, so that when we inject the sample into the GC, immediately before we inject it into the GC, we shut off the flow in the sample loop and we vent it to air using, or to atmosphere, sorry, using the atmospheric referencing valve. So when we switch the atmospheric referencing valve on, it switches um, the sample loop from going to flare to going to an atmospheric referencing vent. There's actually very little flow because we also stop the flow going into the sample loop, but we switch it on for enough time for that sample loop to equalize to atmospheric pressure, and then we inject it into the GC. And typically that will be about five seconds. So, um, so if we look at the sample, the analysis loop, the analysis uh, cycle time, um, for five seconds, we will shut off the sample flow, turn on the atmospheric referencing vent, and allow that sample loop to vent to atmosphere. And then after we've done that for five seconds, we will then inject the sample into the GC so that we inject the sample at the sample at uh, atmospheric pressure rather than at the pressure of the flare line. Now that brings up another question that was brought up, which was um, what do we do if we've got a low sample uh, pressure and maybe the vent, maybe, a, the, sorry, the, um, the flare line, maybe at a higher pressure than the sample. And this does happen quite often. Uh, in that case, yes, we will have to install a sample pump, uh, which will um, pump the uh, sample, will suck the sample out of the process line uh, and pump it through the GC sample system and then onto the flare. So you will need to have some pressure uh, above the uh, expected vent line. So typically in the US, we would say uh, 10 to 20 psi is a high pressure for the vent line, uh, for the flare line. So we would have a pump that would be higher than that so that we always have that positive flow going through um, the sample system through into the flare line, but we would also have that atmospheric referencing valve where we can, um, where we can uh, reference to atmosphere at the uh, time that we inject into the GC. Uh, now there's another question about what is the dew point of H2S in a uh, hydrocam sample. 
Um, the issue with H2S is not so much hydrocarbon dew point. Um, there's some other things that happen with H2S. H2S is a is a very sticky compound. It loves to stick to uh, to metal. It loves to stick to pretty much everything. And so um, typically, if we are trying to measure H2S, so we're looking to actually measure and get results on the H2S, we'll use what's called silco-coated steel or some other um, passivated steel uh, sample systems that have a special coating that um, don't uh, absorb the H2S compounds. Because if you don't use this material, what can happen is the sample lines act as like a, a, a uh, H2S um, bank. Uh, when you get a very rich sample, some of the H2S will stick to the sides of the sample system. Now, it doesn't matter how hot the sample system is, uh, some of it will stick to the, to the metal just because of the, the stickiness properties of the, uh, of the H2S. I know that's not an uh, engineering chemical term, but, uh, but the H2S is very sticky. And so even if you've heated everything, um, if you have lots of H2S, some of it will stick to the sides. And then when the H2S levels go down, some of that H2S will go back into the sample and get analyzed. And so uh, in both cases, you're getting a wrong result. When the H2S level is high, then uh, you're getting a lower result because some of that H2S is sticking to the sides of the sample system. And then when the H2S uh, level goes down and some of the H2S comes out of the sample system, you then get a, um, you get a higher reading than what you should. And it's like a, a hydrocarbon bank. So, uh, sorry, in this case, a H2S bank. So when we're doing H2S samples, when we're measuring H2S, we will use uh, silica-coated steel for all of the sample conditioning systems and also for the columns inside the GC so that we can uh, avoid that stickiness of the H2S. And we'll also heat it as well to uh, try and reduce the amount of uh, H2S that gets stuck in the sample lines. Um, so hopefully I've answered that question. Um, we've got some other questions coming in now. Um, um, Does H2S dissolve in water? Do you recommend uh, I don't know what that word is, but do we recommend to put um, I, I think what you're asking there is uh, if you've got H2S, do you recommend having the sample go through a bubbler so that it gets um, washed out? Um, it really depends on your process. On a natural gas sample, I would say no. Uh, but in some process samples, we may use, uh, actually, we tend to use that for SO2 uh, or for some other compounds, not so much H2S. But um, I would generally move away from using a bubbler for any kind of um, uh, gas GC analysis simply because when you go through a water bubbler like that where you're bubbling the sample through a water, you're adding a lot of volume but also you're going to make the uh, moisture content of the gas very high, which can cause other problems in the analysis. So I wouldn't recommend that. Okay, and that's enough for the questions. There are some other questions that we'll answer um, on, the, uh, on email later on, um, but I think that's it. So. We'll just leave it open for another two minutes or so while we wait for any more questions to come on through. Uh, I've got a question here. I, I'm, I've, I've got to try and interpret this question a little bit. Once I was in a project where some condensation was in, uh, condensates were injected into the pipeline and were difficult to recalibrate the GC, what is your recommended, re recommendation in that case? Um, I, I've got a, I, I'm assuming there that some very heavy components were injected into the pipeline and that went through the sample system and then into the columns and the GC. Um, it really depends on what those condensates were. Um, my first response would be you should have had liquid filters on there to stop any condensates getting into the GC. 
to stop any liquids getting in there. Uh, the next step I would say would be to overhaul the analysis valves. Sometimes that can clog up uh, column one, so you may need some new columns, um, but it really depends on each individual situation. So there's not a, a general response I can give to that simply because it depends on what those condensates were and, and how bad the condensation was. But um, we do have a process sometimes where we do what we call an oil change, where um, suddenly you know you get a lot of liquids through the GC, and generally just because of time and effort, we uh, will uh, overhaul the analysis valves and replace the columns and the detector, um, and um, then the GC will be okay after that. Um, it is important to replace the detector in those situations because the detectors get coated, and um, it will give you long-term drift problems as the uh, the coating impacts the detector. So uh, that's one thing that people don't remember. They replace the columns, they overhaul the valves, they clean out their sample system, and then they're struggling with a GC that drifts over six or seven months. Um, that's a problem because they haven't replaced the detector. So uh, replace the detectors as well whenever you have that kind of issue. Oh, gee, keep going. Okay, uh, there was crude oil carrying over from the production separator into the natural gas stream. However, the only liquid protection they have is the Genie 120. Um, actually, in that case, what there is now on the market is there's several probes that have that liquid filter um, immediately on the probe. Um, I really like those systems because uh, it's not inside the sample line, but it's immediately outside the sample line. I really like those systems because they do clean themselves. Um, Welker have one, A plus have one, and several other customers, ha uh, sorry, several other suppliers have them as well. Um, but there's these sample probes that have a, a liquid membrane um, immediately after the G uh, after the sample is taken out of the pipeline. And the important thing to note here is that these probes have a um, bypass loop on them, so they'll take sample out of the pipeline, but also they will put sample back into the pipeline so that they're always sweeping that membrane clean. Um, with some of the older probes that we see where the membrane is actually inside the pipe, um, what can happen is that membrane be can become saturated with liquids, and it actually starts to enrich the sample as the sample has to go through that saturated membrane. And so what you really need to have is a system where that membrane is continually swept, swept clean. And uh, those probes, uh, the new probes that are coming out by Walker and A+, where they um, sweep the uh, membrane clean and actually return the, the wet sample to the sample line, are good for that situation. Um, I've got a question here. Is, is there's trace H2S in a sample. Is it okay to use a sample cooler in the line? Um, I, I, without more details on what you're analyzing and what you're uh, looking at, it's hard to answer that question. Um, sometimes for SEM systems, we will use a sample cooler and some other process systems where we need to be really careful because uh, not only H2S, but SO2 and uh, other components can be really affected by a cooler, and so we just need to be really careful about that. So uh, I think that's a question that if you send us more, uh, send us an email to the uh, analyzers uh, marketing uh, email, which is uh, on the link there, then uh, we can probably answer that question with much more detail. Okay, we're over our time now, um, so I'll hand it back to Bonnie. All right, so thank you guys. Uh, we will have this uh, webinar posted within the next day or two on the website, uh, so, and we have two more uh, webinars coming up. And based on some of these questions, some of these may actually be useful. I think the sample handling um, webinar we're given in October will be based on these questions of quite interest to many of you. And then obviously before that in August, we have maintaining your GC at 
optimum level. So that also will talk about some of these issues you guys have been facing, how to avoid that, and if you do have them, how we can get your GC back to working correctly. So again, we thank you for your time today. This will be posted and we will have this up there and this will be available for demand anytime you want, as well as a copy of the presentation is located online. So thanks guys, have a good day, bye-bye. Thank you.